Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Cyber Policy Center's uh, weekly lunch seminar. Today, I'm delighted and honored to have uh, my colleague Andy Shbliski, um, uh present today. His work is perhaps, in my view, the best in terms of understanding how social media and well-being are related. And his work has inspired a number of studies uh, here at Stanford. And we continue to use the way he analyzes data as the uh, cutting edge state of the art for understanding how to think about social media and well-being. So I'm really delighted to have him here today. And I'll uh, let him take over. Please join me in welcoming Andy. All right, uh, Jeff, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, I'm really happy that we have uh, the time that we have uh, for me to share some of the work that we've been doing and uh, also for you to share any questions or concerns or, or comments uh, uh, pretending to be questions uh, in, in the remainder of our time. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about a line of work uh, that I've been working on uh, with friends and colleagues um, for the last three or so years. Um, so it's one line of work and I'm going to try to condense it uh, into 40 minutes. Um, I, I hope you'll find it informative or, or at least vaguely interesting. Um, I want to kick off by thanking uh, uh, absolutely uh, my colleague, uh, now Professor Mate Viore, uh, who is an assistant and hopefully soon to be associate professor at the Uni University of Tilburg. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Huo Family Foundation, uh, who have stuck with us uh, through thick and thin uh, when results may not conform uh, with our pre-existing biases or thoughts about the role of social media and technology in our lives. Um, it generates positive and negative reception in the press sometimes. I and mean, obviously, thank you to Jeff and to the Cyber Policy Center uh, for uh, uh, inviting me to contribute to your uh, winter seminar series. Um, today, I'm going to be sharing uh, with you a talk in three parts. Um, first, I'm going to talk about um, why uh, we might want to study uh, or why questions about how the uh, adoption and the use of the internet and related technologies uh, are linked to well-being for those who don't kind of live and swim and breathe or other metaphors uh, with respect to the topic. Um, second, I'm going to describe in the second part uh, three kinds of studies that we did that are kind of tightly related to each other, uh, try, trying to get into some of the nuts and bolts of the research uh, so you can kind of see what we did and how we did it. And then finally, I'm going to try to try to provide some context about how we might think about um, what these investigations mean for our, our ideas about how the internet, uh, mobile phones, and social media relate uh, to mental health and well-being uh, on a global level. All right? So uh, it's kind of a wild topic, uh, but I'll uh, just jump right in uh, with some background. Um, because this, is, th this used to not be background for me. This is something that, that I had to learn. Uh, and I remain shocked uh, that research happens uh, uh, on this topic the way that it does. So I think in, in order to do that, uh, at least to orient you to that, um, you have to kind of for a moment uh, understand, you have to at least for a moment understand what's believed about uh, the internet and well-being. And I think kind of conceptually or philosophically, many of the people who kind of study this or talk about the topic of how the online world uh, kind of influences us or influences young people or influences society, they kind of approach it with a very kind of Descartian idea, uh, a kind of digital dualism, that there's an analog world and a digital world, and these are separate things. They don't really uh, uh, meaningfully touch each other, and when they do meaningfully touch each other, uh, it can be quite negative. Um, and that there's a qualitative difference between the kind of online digital world and the offline analog world. This is kind of priced in uh, uh, to a lot of um, kind of how people make their hypotheses uh, and how people go out and set out to collect data uh, on the topic or, or look for solutions uh, for technological things. Um, the, the second thing that I've discovered when kind of looking at the background of this research area is that it's widely believed um, that, well, I'm not saying the field of communication doesn't exist, but it's widely believed that actually things like the internet or, or one-to-many or, or many-to-one, these kinds of things that have been kind of cornerstones of communication research in the last 50 years, um, that these technologies are fundamentally brand new. And young people and adults only really started using social media and smartphones sometime between 2010 and 2012. 
the Pew, the Pew Center for Internet and Society has never existed. Um, and that's not true. I, I'm quite old, but I did use a lot of social media uh, in, the, in the mid and late 1990s. Um, and then the third thing, uh, which is kind of an invention of let's say the last five years, is an idea that the introduction of the internet has actually really been a, been a causal factor uh, in declines in mental health and well-being in young people the world over. Um, this, th this really did uh, not exist for very long before the pandemic. Uh, we were much more worried about violent video games uh, and Dungeons and Dragons uh, and rap music before that. Um, so, so with beliefs in, in hand, uh, we might ask ourselves before we set out doing research on this topic, what might the science show? Uh, what might we understand about the links between the internet well-being uh, and, and mental health? Um, and it, it's really important to, to, to understand, especially for people who, who don't live this world, live in this world, that there actually are a series of systematic evidence reviews on the topic, uh, some of which Jeff's team and others have done. Uh, uh, really uh, excellent work that's kind of focused on some of these questions uh, in an open way. Um, and these systematic reviews show a few different things, but generally they show that either the links between social media use uh, uh, and, and young person outcomes and mental health are either somewhat positive, slightly negative, or, or null, or mixed. There really isn't a clear consensus besides the fact that there isn't a consensus. And this is not just kind of pulling studies out of a hat or, or reading things that are published online, or blogs, or, or Google Docs. Um, this is what happens when people have their hypotheses about the literatures before they conduct their literature reviews, and they register those, re those, those protocols um, before they set out to find uh, what's going on uh, uh, in the research. Um, there's, there are widespread issues of something called researcher degrees of freedom. Um, this is when researchers are going out and they're collecting their data uh, uh, or analyzing data, but they don't have a clear plan before they go about reporting it. Um, and this can especially be a problem in large-scale data where you have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of participants, many different ways that you can measure technology use and many different ways you can measure outcomes like well-being. Um, you know, in some of these data sets, there are upwards of trillions of different ways that you could analyze the data. And when you do that, you, must, you, you can very frequently find exactly what your biases would tell you are there. Um, and, and I guess really importantly, on the same footing, is, is the fact that the great majority of the research about mental health and, and technology and social media, um, it claims to be describing a global phenomenon, the internet kind of slamming into our societies. But upwards of 95% of the research that's done on this topic comes from samples in either English-speaking or Northern European countries. This leaves out more than 90% of young people around the world, of which nearly all have access to the internet uh, in some form. Uh, now. So really, a global picture of the long-term trends, a truly global picture, has been missing. Um, and, and I think into this kind of vacuum of evidence and into this kind of, uh, uh, this presence of really strong prior beliefs about kind of when social media was invented or what effect it has on us, is, is some really interesting uh, public science communication uh, and some lessons that we might learn uh, from this. Um, some of it is like fairly broad, uh, uh, painted with fairly uh, broad brush strokes. Um, and it's kind of interesting how it kind of lurches around. So for about 20 years, the uh, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics had what they called the two by two rule. This was uh, guidance for parents and for teachers um, and, and other caregivers that essentially was, if you have a child, don't expose them to any kinds of screens or technologies before the age of two. And once they turn to, limit daily consumption to only two hours a day. So for nearly 20 years, this was the official position of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Until 2016, when they decided that there was in fact, or admitted that there was no evidence base uh, at all for the advice. And they set out to, to promulgate something different for parents. And it's interesting because while the AAP might have moved away from this advice, this broad brushstroke advice for all kids and for all parents, it, it didn't disappear. A couple of years later, the World Health Organization came out with the exact same advice, but appeared to have almost complete amnesia of the fact that the AAP had walked back their guidance. Um, there's some really interesting things happening with advice now around social media. Uh, arbitrary uh, kind of cutoffs, screen time limits, uh, plans to have age gate technology, 
uh, not being able to use TikTok without parental permission in some states. Um, and there's really a mushrooming. So those are kind of more uh, maybe conservative pundits might be pushing some of those ideas here in the US. Uh, similar factors are in the UK and Europe, but not, not nearly as much. Um, but kind of on the left, there's a really interesting tendency. There's almost like a mushrooming of design codes and frameworks to help empower parents and young people. And so it's really kind of an interesting polarized dynamic where you have these two sets of solutions, um, either some form of restriction and, and kind of gating or some form of kind of technological optim socio-technological optimism saying, oh man, we can just design this better. Um, but in both cases, as a researcher, it's kind of interesting to me because neither of these are particularly well evidenced. They just appear to be value-oriented uh, prescriptions, um, some of which are consistent with my pre-existing biases uh, uh, from my own political positions. Uh, and then the really interesting thing that's happening right now, especially in North America, is that there's a series of class action lawsuits where um, people have decided for whatever reason that they're going to uh, engage their state's attorney generals and, and sue large games companies and social media companies for putative harms to the mental, and health, uh, mental health and well-being of young people. Um, and I'm really, uh, I, I think it's interesting, I think it's exciting, um, but I don't think it's necessarily exciting in a good way um, because I don't think it's a good idea that uh, courts determine matters of fact uh, or science. Um, it didn't go well when they tried to ban violent video games. Um, so, so with that behind, me, behind us, uh, I can talk about some science for a bit. Uh, and so it's a, I, I tend to think of this as an interesting mess. I think, tend to think of this as grist for the mill. Uh, I tend to think of this while there's lots of bad science. I try to see kind of what inspiration can be drawn from it and what kind of muse could this be for us. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a really terrible version of the Mona Lisa, I guess. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of the research uh, that this mess inspired for us. Um, so for each of these studies um, there's, uh, that I'm going to talk about, uh, there's one uh, published last year in Clinical Psychological Science that's about kind of the impact. Um, and I see pictures. This is lovely. Uh, hopefully Jeff and my hosts will just share the slides with you. You're free to have them uh, and click them. Um, but there are three studies I'll talk about. I'll talk about a study about generally the penetration of the internet and uh, mobile broadband uh, that was published last year in Clinical Psychological Science. Uh, I'll talk about a study that was about uh, Facebook adoption and use uh, uh, across the globe uh, that was published last summer uh, in Royal Society Open Science. And I'll talk a bit about a kind of a, a study that we focused uh, really on uh, to, to look at the anal to analyze the robustness of the first two uh, that should shortly be published in the journal um, uh, Technology, Mind, and Behavior. And so for each of these, I'm going to talk about kind of five aspects. I'm going to talk about the research question and the data sources that kind of structure the work. Uh, I'm going to detail something about the variables of interest that we looked at, that we investigated, that we uh, analyzed. Um, and share something about what we found and what we think what we found means, so findings and implications. And with that, I'll jump right in. Um, specifically, again, this connectivity study uh, that we published in, uh, in uh, clinical psychological science. Um, in terms of research questions, um, we were quite keen to know, actually, is it the case that, that mental health and well-being have changed in the last two decades? Because we get told a lot that there is a men global mental health crisis for young people, um, that they've never been worse off than they are right now. Um, but it occurs to me as someone who, I did grow up in the US, but I've lived in a lot of places that are countries that are not called the United States. Uh, it occurred to me as a researcher that I didn't know anything about those trends. And I felt that that would be a necessary condition, uh, but not sufficient condition, to ask this question about technology impact. Um, the second research question we, we had specifically was um, focused on um, whether or not these trends in mental health and well-being globally, um, are, are these trends in any way, do they run parallel to, are they in any way associated with what, what might be a, a very consistent trend, one that I came in very strongly believing, really the globe has probably become more technologically saturated in the last two decades. I don't really know about health and well-being, but chances are there's more smartphones around now than there was in the year 2000. Um, and then finally, um, I, we wanted to take a look at whether or not factors like age and gender made any difference. You know, let's, let's imagine that there is 
a there are trends in mental health and well-being across the planet. Let's imagine these trends are related to technology adoption or use. Does it really matter what kind of demographic group you come from? Should we be specifically concerned, say, about young women? Does that make sense? All right. I've gotten some affirmative nods from people in the room. Um, it, it, to, to look at this in a very broad, brushstroke kind of way, uh, we looked at data, we pulled data from something called the ITU. This is the International Telecommunication uh, Database. Uh, we, we got data from Gallup, something called the Gallup World Poll. And grayed out here because I'm not really going to focus on it much in the talk. Uh, we looked at data, it's not really data, but it's kind of estimates of mental health data from something called the Global Burden of Disease. These are kind of meta-analytic Bayesian estimates of, say, uh, rates of mental health uh, across the world, across, dec across years, across demographics, uh, uh, across countries. And the time scale of this study, or sorry, I should say the geography for well-being, about 168 countries, for mental health, about 200 countries. Uh, and in terms of time, we looked at a time series of 16 countries uh, for well-being and 19 years for mental health. Um, our key predictors here, which are quite crude, uh, is uh, per capita broadband access and per capita uh, mobile broadband subscriptions. Um, and we looked at three primary measures of well-being, uh, positive and negative psychological experiences. Basically, think of this as kind of a cross-cultural way of asking somebody, Reflect on the last couple days of your life. Are things going? Are good things going? Are good things happening to you, for you, and also are negative things happening to you? How, how do you feel about your life, basically? Uh, uh, your your uh, I don't mean life. I'm sorry. How do you feel about kind of your internal state, about how things are going for you? All right. It's a it's much more. I think it makes a lot more sense cross culturally um, than maybe just an American concept of something like self esteem. All right. Uh, which doesn't translate particularly well. Um, and then we also looked at life satisfaction. So just basically, uh, uh, you know, how people are feeling about their lives in general. All right. And then we complemented this with three measures of mental health uh, from the global burden of disease. In this case, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, and self-harm rates. Um, but I'm not placing emphasis on them here. Uh, they're detailed uh, exhaustively in the papers. Uh, data preparation was fairly straightforward. Um, so what we did was we basically chunked all the data from the ITU into the same kinds of chunks that we had from the global world poll so that we had like for like, apples for apples. Uh, so we kind of could tell you uh, kind of in a five-year age bucket for a specific gender for, uh, uh, in a specific country in a specific year, not only how much, uh, 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 what was the probability of, say, being exposed to mobile broadband, but also what was the average mental health or well-being uh, for that demographic unit. Um, we used a form of uh, meta-analytic uh, Bayesian regression models, and uh, we, we did this because we had a, a bunch of exploratory research questions, and we wanted to protect against our own biases or capitalizing on chance. So now we get figures. So this is where the real science happens, uh, everyone. Uh, just to orient you to these, um, uh, I can't really see my own screens here, but um, in, 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 in in this figure, you can see here that there are five facets. Uh, the first two, um, uh, uh, each facet's labeled internet, mobile, life satisfaction, negative experiences, and positive experiences. These are the variables I just spoke about very briefly. Along the x-axis is time, so from the year 2000 until the year 2020 or 2021. I forget when this time series specifically ends. Um, and then we've just normalized the y-axis so that they're in common units. Uh, across the, the five variables here. Um, the, the gray lines are individual countries, and the blue lines are the averages uh, across all countries. Um, I'm sure you'll all be shocked to learn that both mobile broadband and home broadband increased in the last two decades. Uh, really good to have a positive result. Um, so, so we can, we can, we can uh, uh, if you spend money on technology, technology begins to exist. Uh, so this is a good uh, uh, validation of that. Um, but we also saw some interesting trends. So life satisfaction across the globe has been uh, particularly flat in the last two decades. Um, but there have been increases both in positive and negative experiences uh, over time. And we do break this down a bit in the paper. In some parts of the world where, say, there was massive investment after the fall of communism, uh, things actually look quite a bit better for people. Um, but that's really a story for, uh, that, that's a different story uh, for a different kind of talk. Um, there's a lot going on here. Uh, I apologize for it. But basically, um, this is in the top panel, 
uh, uh, these are all individual countries and how they've varied over time in terms of their life satisfaction, negative psychological experiences, and positive psychological experiences. That's that first bar. Those individual dots are individual countries and how they moved over time in the last 20 years. Um, and then much less prominently, uh, uh, much less kind of colored in, uh, we have the associations between internet penetration and mobile broadband and these outcomes. So very, very briefly, um, there were many countries, 25% of countries, where something like life satisfaction went up. There were 32 countries where life satisfaction went down. Uh, and there were uh, the great majority of countries, about 56% of the countries, or 92, 92 of the countries, where there wasn't any clear trend. All right. uh, in, in all cases, uh, there were some similarities uh, with, with links between technology and, and these outcomes, um, but they were all much, much smaller, and they were all much less consistent. So time was actually a fairly, uh, it was a weak predictor, but it was a much better predictor of outcomes for people and countries. Um, we broke this down even more. We wanted to know something about whether or not the demographics mattered. So you see here, these are the same three outcomes, life satisfaction, negative experiences, and positive psychological experiences. And then kind of paneled down the y-axis is time or year, and then home broadband, and then mobile internet. And you can see this is broken up by both gender, which is, or I should say sex in this data, uh, which is uh, uh, orange and green, and also by age, which is running down the side. And that's a lot of description to tell you there's a whole lot of nothing here. We looked at, we looked at age, we looked at gender, we looked at 168 to 200 different countries, and what we found was there's a positive association between there being mobile phones that connect to the internet in a country and life satisfaction for you, not for you, but for someone. Um, and this didn't really matter if you were male or female. It didn't really matter if you were 15 or 10 or 89. It tended to be a trend in the data. It was the only trend in the data. And it was so small, we don't actually believe it's true. So we used something called, small, we used the smallest effect size of interest to try to separate the signal from the noise. We defined what we thought a signal was before we analyzed the data. And even those very convincing uh, 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 dots that are colored in, um, we're not particularly positive about them being uh, reflecting a, a quote unquote true phenomenon. So what did we find here? Across 168 countries in 16 years, um, we found very, very little evidence of, of anything uh, distinctive, except very basic stuff that you could you would probably know if you didn't study communication and you didn't study psychology, which is that there's a great deal of variability between countries. Countries are different, and people vary in terms of their happiness and their satisfaction and their mental health and their well-being. Um, and this probably has to do with economic and social factors, um, maybe not technology. There is uh, there are some general trends to people reporting more experiences. Uh, both positive and negative ones across the, uh, across the globe. Um, but there was no evidence for, for what are thought of to be vulnerable groups, like young women in this case, being maybe more vulnerable to their just being more s internet and, and, and mobile phones connecting to the internet in their country. So it's, it's pretty clear that, from this data at least, the only thing that appears to be clear is that there's really strong evidence for nothing going on here. We tried our best to find something that went on with the best possible data uh, that we had. And I guess the best possible data is a bit of a strategic disclaimer for me because this data might not be particularly great. I happen to know where a lot of this data is. And Jeff, which way is, which way is east? east? A lot of the data is that way. Well, hold on. I don't have a compass. Everyone else looks very worried. All right. Well, <laughs> assuming east is towards the audience, um, what I did was uh, we went east. And so in this study, uh, what we did was we analyzed data um, that we asked for uh, from Meta. And we asked the question uh, in a slightly different way and maybe in a slightly better way, I would hope. Um, and the specific questions that we asked were, well, does Facebook adoption relate to well-being? If it does, do these relations depend on, on 
demographic factors like age and sex. And then how might these, if we're adopting a global position, how might these associations also vary by country? It could be the case that there's some aspect of Facebook and Messenger and social media that actually matters a lot in, in country X versus country Y because they have different moderation policies. Things are being monetized differently. Um, there might be different advice to parents about how to approach technology uh, uh, that would be meaningful and would show up in the data. So what we did here was we used something called uh, FORT, which is the Facebook Open Research Tool, which is a really lovely selection of, of uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks that I never want to see again. Uh, and um, and, and we, we combined these data uh, uh, with some of the data that I talked about before, uh, different types of well-being data uh, from the Gallup World Poll and from uh, the Global Burden of Disease. And, and, and the Facebook researchers um, were able to kind of get engagement data for about 72 countries uh, of those that we had well-being and mental health data for. Uh, and they were able to kind of uh, um, uh, pull it together across a 12-year period uh, from 2008 to 2019. Uh, in terms of what data they actually had on offer, uh, this is detailed in the paper, but essentially it was daily active users and monthly active users counts, DAU and MAU. Uh, in each of these countries, I think in June or July, uh, they were able to we were able to regularize the data for that. Uh, in terms of gender, they can make a pretty good guess and age a pretty good guess uh, about uh, if a user is male or female. And across countries, they can make a pretty good guess about age. Uh, and these were the most fine-grained categories that they could have, either 13 to 34-year-olds or 35 plus. And this has a lot to do with a trade-off. Say, in a specific country, in a specific year, they might have a much better guess about someone's being in one, you know, one age versus another age. But kind of regularized across this kind of data frame, um, this is the highest fidelity data that they could produce. Uh, and we're continuing to press them uh, for more of this. I, I don't just uh, take the data. And, uh, at the word. Um, but in any case, uh, we once again looked at life satisfaction, negative and positive experiences, and also mental health variables such as anxiety and self-harm. Uh, in terms of how we prepared the data, um, we, we, we adjusted it uh, for UN demographic uh, 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 data that we had at hand. Um, and we redid the data uh, for things like well-being uh, into the same types of buckets. Uh, so we're kind of able, in a weird way, we were able to turn data from almost a million participants into kind of these, uh, uh, into 3,000 participants, kind of like demographic, country, year, people. Not people, but, but units of analysis, uh, data from people. Uh, we used the similar analysis method again here. Um, we looked at 72 countries instead of 168, and we conducted the models separately. We initially just were going to do DAU models, um, but the MAU came for free. So we also uh, uh, did those uh, just to have a sanity check on ourselves. Um, I like these figures quite a bit more uh, than the ones that I showed you before. All right, so um, in, in, in facet A, facet lowercase a, um, we have Facebook engagement. Uh, in, and this is uh, both um, Facebook Messenger and Facebook platform engagement. In facet B, we have uh, mental health, uh, sorry, we have well-being. Uh, for the different uh, uh, sections of the population. And in facet C, I've created, I've added helpful examples so you can interpret the other two facets. All right, so you can see uh, between the years of 2000 in facet A, between the years 2008 and 2019, uh, for those who are 13 to 34, uh, Facebook becomes rapidly popular and then planes off. Uh, those of us who are certainly older than 35, uh, across this time period, there's a gradual increase across countries. Each one of these lines is a, is a country. Uh, in terms of, so you can see generally a gentle increase, but you can also see a sharp increase and then it planes off. So the, the data on average has a certain kind of mm, pattern to it. All right, you can basically just draw these with your hand. If you had to draw the well being variables, you would just kind of take out like a thing and just sketch randomly. It's not really clear what's going on. Um, and so you can plot these a different way like in facet C. So red here is let's say daily active Facebook users. Blue here is life satisfaction. Green here is negative psychological experiences. And um, oh my god, what color is that? Purple? Purple here is, is positive experiences. And this is just for Greece, Japan, Jordan, Nicaragua, Pakistan, and Sweden. 
So you can kind of see, you can just look at these plots if you wanted to and ask yourself, um, well, in Jordan, it looks like there's a pretty clear march of daily active users in Facebook between 2008 and 2019. That's the red line. You know, what the heck is going on for something like life satisfaction? Is life satisfaction just falling off a cliff in 2010 because teenagers discover Facebook? Well, maybe not 2010, but 2009, all right? So then, uh, because we're psychologists, we did math. We weren't just happy looking at a picture, even though the picture is fairly, fairly clear as pictures go. Um, so we wanted to see whether or not these things were actually linked to daily active use and monthly active use within these countries was linked to well-being. We found that both DAU and MAU uh, on a between country level were positively associated with well-being. Um, we also found that they were both negatively, uh, uh, negatively linked to, to negative psychological experiences. So positive on the positive and negative on the negative. Uh, and these effects were strongest actually for the youngest, young, for, for the youngest demographics. So the, the associations were stronger, significantly stronger for 13 to, 33, 13 to 34 year olds. Uh, and uh, there were no differences on the basis of uh, gender. We broke this down and I've abbreviated this table here. Um, but it might be the case that there, there are differences within countries, uh, sorry, between and within countries. So what we did here was we took all 72 countries and all the different demographic groups that people could come from, either 13 to 35 or 36 plus, male or female, and then just kind of an A to Z list from uh, Argentina through Venezuela. And we gave these models the greatest chance to find, is there a mental health crisis in Uganda among middle-aged men who use Facebook. We, we were able to test all of those possible permutations instead of just plucking one out of a hat and, and writing something on our substack. Um, oh, I, sorry, I should say, we did do all of those analyses. And it, again, was a, a, maybe a whole bunch of nothing. So I'm going to give an example of life satisfaction. So let's say we really were life satisfaction researchers and we care about life satisfaction and Facebook and mobile, uh, um, uh, Facebook Messenger kind of social media engagement across the last 12 years. Um, we found that there were two countries where there was a, a, a credibly positive association for, for groups between, let's say, MAU or DAU and the outcome of interest life satisfaction. There were zero countries where there was a negative relation and the remainder were not significant in any way. Similar patterns for something like negative, negative, uh, 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 negative psychological experiences. Zero countries was credibly positive. So this is the, the opposite of a negative. So that's OK. Uh, and then there were only three countries where there were lower levels of ne negative experience predicted by the penetration of Facebook and Messenger. I'm not going to labor this any further, but it, again, is a whole lot of nothing. Convincing nothing. Semi-convincing nothing. Um, so what did we find? Well, uh, despite the fact that we were repeatedly accused of, of being funded by Meta for conducting this research, um, that's not the case. Again, the Huo Family Foundation. Um, but no, we found um, kind of, you might not write home about it, but we found uh, uh, generally positive associations. Maybe as a country, there's a lot going on in a country that has more Facebook in it and more Messenger in it. And maybe there's just a very boring explanation for why people in those countries felt better uh, uh, across that period of time. There's other good stuff that, you know, there's a third variable that predicts both Facebook adoption and also uh, different measures of well-being and mental health. The between country associations were a lot stronger than the within country associations. Uh, and that's probably for some very boring um, uh, modeling decision reasons. Um, within, within results often are a bit squirrelier. Um, and then um, we, we didn't find many sex differences, any sex differences to write home about, um, but there was a clear, uh, a, a clear moderation uh, in terms of age with younger participants uh, showing higher levels of well-being when there was more Facebook penetration in their year in their demographic. So anyway, so, so this is great, this is fun, but this doesn't let us look at really robustly uh, this is just one way of looking at the data. 
Uh, and obviously, a single platform can't capture kind of what's going on in the home. Um, and while it might be a fair test of the idea that social media and smartphones have destroyed a, a generation of young people all across the globe, uh, it may not be uh, the, the test that I want to end this conversation or this lecture on. Um, maybe we want to do another study uh, because we're scientists. Um, so this study, what we did was we tried to put what I talked about before um, absolutely to the test. We wanted to look at individual level factors and we wanted to test it as kind of thoroughly as humanly possible with the best data that we had available to them. And so we used an approach that we've used before called multiverse analysis where we basically take out a whiteboard and we write down all the different ways we might analyze the data or any way someone who disagrees with us might analyze the data. And we just analyze the data every single damn way we can. All right, so we had two research questions here. The first was, um, how does, how does well-being differ between individuals who do have access to uh, uh, the internet, who use the internet, and have access on their phone? D does, does being an individual who has that in your life, uh, how does that relate to well-being? And then the second one was basically taking into account all the things we can learn about people, the types of things that we think are probably associated both with well-being and having access to technology, holding those things constant and then kind of interrogating how age and gender might, might be other intervening factors, um, will we see a link of any kind between this type of adoption of technology and this type of use of technology and well-being and mental health? So we looked at data from about 2.4 million people across 168 countries, again, across, I think, I can't do subtraction right now because I'm speaking. Let's just say 18 years, 19 years, some number like that. Please don't correct me. Um, and, and we had, um, uh, uh, we looked at three predictors, um, access to the internet in your home, recent use of the internet, uh, and because uh, you have to remember this is quite a long time series, so there will be years in which that this answer is answered uh, uh, all as the maximum response icon, uh, option in, in South Korea, long before that's the answer, say, here in the United States, long before, say, that's uh, the answer in some place in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and also, uh, do you have a mobile phone that you can use to access the internet? That also varies quite a bit. But this, again, is all uh, individual level data. Um, we also looked at, we did a mini literature review, and we found the six best uh, uh, covariates we could, uh, things that we thought of as colliders uh, between our outcomes and our predictors, uh, things that we thought would be really great predictors of well-being uh, in a way that's not as boring as someone who studies technology. Uh, and we looked at eight outcomes here, so the ones you've seen before, uh, but we also looked at questions having to do with social life, uh, purpose in life, aspects of physical health, aspects of community cohesion, um, and also aspects of, of the broader social kind of contract between people and their societies. So we really tried to cast a very wide net. Uh, we followed the rules when it came to the Gallup World Poll data, so we used their code book, nothing fancy. Uh, and we also, because we were using the full data and individual level data, we were able to use um, or consider using what are called model weights. So I should have said this a long time ago, but the Gallup data is really interesting because it's a study of, a, a, in each year, in each country, a thousand non-institutionalized people aged 16 to however long people live uh, get interviewed and their answers kind of go into this. Um, so we know a lot about people that isn't those, those three boring questions about technology use. And we tried to bring those together. And one of the cool things is you can also bring in model weights. So a sense in some way of how good of a job did Gallup do in that country in that year. All right. Um, so, so we again did a bunch of statistics because we are psychologists. Um, but what, the thing that's a little bit different here is again, in casting a wide net and thinking about all the different ways that you could kind of pick out one demographic versus another as a moderator or a mediator or some kind of intervening variable, we, we wanted to make sure that we weren't fooling ourselves. So instead of kind of picking that one perfect analysis that kind of shows the technology is good or bad, we identified a universe of over 33,000 different ways to analyze the data, and then we did that. All right, so before we get to multiverse, we can talk about some very basic uh, analyses presented here. So uh, uh, across the top are the outcomes, life satisfaction through the social cohesion measure. 
Uh, the first row is uh, internet access. The second row is internet use. The third row is internet on your phone. There's some missing data because the way that the data is collected is not always consistent over the entire time series. Um, there are three dots in each one of these facets. The first dot is not having the thing. The second dot is having the thing or doing the thing. And the third dot is the difference. So you can see if there's a net difference between points one and points two. All right. Um, long story short, um, there are positive associations between having and using internet technologies and all eight measures of well-being. Well, maybe I've just picked out the analyses that support my, my beliefs and, 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 and my biases as someone who is obviously on the payroll of big tech. I'm not. I'm wearing very normal clothes. Um, no, uh, so what we did was we, we analyzed the data all the different ways we could. And so each one of these plots along the x-axis is the, the ordered from most negative to most positive is each one of the uh, uh, Bayesian hierarchical models we did. That little funny little bump on the right side of each one of the facets is the average effect. Significant positive effects are blue. Significant negative effects are red. The little ziggy zaggy is the confidence interval. And gray is when one of the point estimates, uh, uh, sorry, when the credibility interval around the point estimate uh, crossed zero, all right? Um, that, that is a lot to say, um, but hold on one second. Um, that's a long way of saying that in 84.9% of the cases, in 85% of those 33,000 different ways of analyzing the data, the link between technology either access or technology use was positive. Negative on negative, positive on positive. In about 15% of cases, 15% of the models, there was no association that was statistically significant or the, the credibility intervals crossed zero. And in 0.4% of the models, there was what could, be inter what could be interpreted as a negative association between technology use or engagement and well-being. And we'll dig into that a little bit. And I'll dig into that in a little bit in just a moment. Um, we then looked at this third research question, which is kind of how durable are these models to different types of covariate specifications. So we broke things down in terms of uh, uh, pr uh, predictor and gender and age. Sorry, yes? Did you just see a thing? Oh. My slide is still here. <laughs> it's actually much less pretty than the last slide. So just imagine that previous slide again. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, imagine a bunch of squiggly lines that have colors to them. And uh, imagine that they start off very far away from the y-axis, and that when you add controls to them, they get slightly closer to the y-axis, but not so much that they still aren't statistically significant, uh, and they aren't still pro possibly practically significant in people's lives. So we threw everything we could at it after we did those models, and still the squiggly lines were squiggly away from the zero point. All right. Sorry for that. Um, so what did we learn from this study? Um, well, we, we found that the general associations on both the between country and the within country levels were positive, largely positive, between technology uh, 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 kind of adoption and use and access and different types of well-being. Um, we found this was the case in 85% of the models we looked at. 10%, uh, sorry, 15% were null, and less than half of 1% looked negative or, or the um, uh, uh, possibly something we would worry about. And I, I'll, I'll go back, and I just want to say, so, so again, the, the bit that we worry about is this little red bit in the third, in the third column in the second row where, the, where there's that kind of like little scrunched up little bit there. So we went and we looked at what variables were accounting for those negative associations, what kind of, what kind of pairing between kind of covariate, demographic group, uh, uh, kind of who, who represented that, that little red bit, that half of 1%. And in a, in, 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 a, in, a, uh, uh, in an audience who's been primed to be worried about teenage girls and the internet, um, 
I, I have, I have very, very good and bad news for you, which is that almost everyone in that red bit was a teenage girl. The predictor, so this was true. These, these analyses come through for young women in the sample. So let's say 16 to 24 in many of the countries in the sample between them saying they've, they've really, they've used the internet in the last seven days and the outcome was how they judge the social cohesion in their community. So if I was a young woman being approached by a Gallup researcher in this data in these years and you asked me, hey, do you frequently use the internet? Have you recently used the internet? And I say yes or I'm likely to say yes, because this is all probabilistic. And then I get asked the question, this city or area where you live in, is it the perfect place for you? I'm slightly more likely to say no. Not I am depressed, not I'm anxious, not smartphones have created a mental health ap epidemic. I'm likely to say, no, this isn't the perfect place for me. Now, I nearly have a teenage daughter. I knew a number of teenage girls in my life. Um, I remember being a teenage boy. I remember not particularly liking where I went to high school. I also remember liking to use the internet. I'm not sure that we can attribute the internet to this specific correlation, given what the questions are. I think that there might be a group of young women who live in a place that is not the area or city that is the perfect place for them. And I think they might prefer to use the internet. You say, of course, there are whole books predicated on the causal arrow going the other way. There are people who give the Surgeon General advice entirely selling the idea that the causal arrow goes the other way. All right. so. Uh, this is individual level data. It's self-report data. Uh, it's not perfect. It's not even that great, but it's the best we have. And I submit to you that this is not evidence necessarily that the internet is good for you. This is just fairly convincing evidence that social media and the internet probably isn't bad in the ways or for whom we might think. The simple narrative uh, might not fit in the way that we think it does. So what are the implications? All right, well, um, I think we can say that there's no consistent negative global relationship between the rollout of the internet and social media and smartphones and mental health and well-being. All this code is available. As much as I can make this, code, uh, this data available, I've created synthetic data sets so that you can check our work. Some of the data is proprietary. You're allowed, to, you're allowed to email the executive vice president of research at Meta. He's called Curtis. He's also in that direction. Uh, and ask him for access to Fort to check our work. But in almost all cases where there wasn't strong, uh, where there wasn't this positive association, there was fairly strong evidence that there was a null relation, that there wasn't a lot there, at least with this way of framing the question. So I would say that giving, using this best quality data we have in hand, this does not support the popular media narratives when we imagine that there are countries other than the United States where the internet has rolled out in different times to different parts of the population. What can we do as researchers if we're kind of adjacent to this area or, or God, God forbid, we're stuck in this research area? <laughs> um, well, we can avoid general, general, generalities about technology and we can try to get very specific about how the technologies that we're studying are embedded in the socio-technical and, and, and uh, uh, environments that we're, we're, we're examining them in. Instead of kind of focusing on fears and hopes in kind of a way that might not be, that might give technology more um, uh, power than it actually has, or maybe gives it power in a way it doesn't have, um, we can ask uh, uh, more careful questions, more nuanced questions that kind of broaden the conversation instead of it shutting it down and, say, requiring all teenagers in Utah to get their parents' permission before using social media. Um, I, I think that we should collect high quality data and our group is doing this, trying to collect high quality data outside of Europe and at North America. And this means working with scholars all around the world in a way that isn't 
um, exploitative and allows their voices to be part of the conversation so that they can also uh, help us build research questions for the kinds of challenges that they have uh, where they live. Um, and I think it really underscores the need uh, for conducting actual transparent and reproducible methodologically rigorous research. The sad fact of the matter is uh, low quality research with exaggerated claims gets you on television. It gets you clicks. It gets you, it gets you kind of paid advising for class action lawsuits. And, and that's quite a serious conflict of interest. It's, it's quite a serious context to take into mind. Um, and I think that we should be thinking about that uh, because that's the way we think about it when we do research in other sectors of the economy, whether it's kind of things having to do with engineering or uh, uh, hard sciences or medical sciences. It's not disqualifying, but it's important context to think about. Um, and, and I really think as researchers, uh, we, we should also not let tech companies off the hook. Um, I, I think very much um, the most valuable resource they have for advancing the public conversation and public understanding of, of the role of technology in our lives is the data that they either collect or they could collect. And so making sure that they're engaged in transparent open science that's not necessarily funded by them, hopefully not, but it's funded by research councils, government research councils, and other philanthropic groups um, that uh, have a dog in the fight. And we all, I think, have a dog in the fight. Um, and then how can we as researchers communicate? Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, how, how can we communicate outside of you know, where we are now and outside of our, our kind of research world? I think the key thing here to think about potentially is to be very cautious about one size fits all solutions. Um, they can feel good, um, but they probably uh, don't work. And you'll be asked to endorse them if your work is adjacent to this area. I regularly get asked to endorse them. The second thing is to be precise when you give advice to, stake to stakeholders and to decision makers. And by that, by which I mean, um, ask yourself, are you giving this advice because you think it's a good idea, because it's in line with your values, which is absolutely fine? Or are you giving this advice because it's specifically grounded in a set of empirical scientific observations you've made? Because I think there's an important difference there. Because that's what happens in other parts of science, and it doesn't happen here. Because if it's advice for caregivers, they have a limited time budget. If it's advice for policymakers, they have limited political capital. And if it's just your opinion, however well-meaning, it could just be a giant waste of everyone's time. All right, thank you for letting me use your time. Thank you to Mati for being an amazing colleague and for the Huo Foundation for supporting this work. Links are here. You'll get slides. Questions? Thank you so much, Andy. Um, just want to say I really appreciate the care uh, with the analyses, but also looking broadly as you have in over time. I think two things that we've been limited and I think those are giving us a little bit of insight. So I want to ask you with sort of like a ridiculous uh, question since almost all the research is focused here. Ignoring all the other countries, what does it say for the United States? Um, I hesitate to say everything here is fine. Because <laughs> I, 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 while I have lived abroad for the last 15 years, I still do read and subscribe to the New York Times, so that's not true. Um, no, I mean, it, with, it, with kind of an N of one with the United States, um, it, it, it is fine with respect to this aspect of technology. And I, I know I was a bit flippant, Jeff, at the beginning when I said what I said about you know, s the fields of sociology, communication, and psychology existing uh, before the year 2017 or whenever this panic started. But it, it does happen to be the case that young people have used social media in this country in huge numbers very consistently since the mid-90s. There, there is solid data on this. Like, you don't need to read anything past Dana Boyd's It's Complicated to, to, to get that. Um, and, and yeah, no, the, 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 the U.S. has its challenges, but for very different reasons. Great. Um, Likely. <laughs> All right. Uh, one question we're getting from online is um, there's a bit of a disconnect from your research showing 
null effects to maybe positive to people's self perceptions of their own experience and being dissatisfied with their s with social media. How do you reconcile those? Well, I think it's an important kind of. I think it's really important to be able to tell that there's a gap between our dissatisfaction with how we spend our time or our dissatisfaction with how other people spend their time and concepts like mental health and more broadly construed well-being. Like, mental health is a very serious thing. Self-harm is a very serious thing. People dying by suicide is a very serious thing. And that is, is the type of thing that this research is meant to be looking at. It's not meant to look at taste it's not meant to be looking at kind of m m the you know, perceived social morality of how some people choose to spend their time. And I, I think the question is important because it, it raises another question that kind of strikes at the heart of this, which is you have people in this country and in some other places, but mostly here, who say that there are dead teenagers because of social media. You have people in this country who say that people have taken their lives because of a socio-technological system. That's a shocking claim that should require a lot of evidence behind it. I'm very keen on that evidence. But, and this is where, this is where the question is important, it, you then have to ask, well, what is the solution that's offered by somebody who's making such a claim? Less screen time. Wait until someone turns 16 ban TikTok in Texas. These, if you truly believed that these technologies were causing young people to actually die, you wouldn't make jokes about going on a social media vacation. You wouldn't give cutesy BuzzFeed, sorry, I'm dating myself, BuzzFeed advice about kind of turning your screen gray. You would haul these people in front of a judge for murder and that's what happens, you realize that that gap is there between us using, say, the word addiction informally to describe something that's very attractive and fun versus something that destroys lives. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, 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 I get that there's that disconnect there, but th that, that disconnect kind of betrays the fact that we're, we're, we're kind of rhetorically getting taken advantage of when we kind of let a concept like technology engagement and a concept like mental health kind of expand outside of what it really is. Thank you. Here's another disconnect. Um, your work is looking really broadly right now across nations, which has obvious value. What about within um, nations? We've talked a lot here about heterogeneity, so that for some people it may be positive and some people it may be worse. How do you think about that so for instance is it, is it possible that for some young people it really is you know um, harmful at the mental health level while for many others it's not yeah so this is a this is a this is interesting because it's a hard question to ask in a vacuum because the fact of the matter is that many many young people use these technologies so a couple years ago, I was, I, was, I was approached and I was asked about this coroner's report in the United Kingdom, where he had noticed that the last four people, the last four men, young men who, who took their lives, they had all played Call of Duty. And he, he called for a parliamentary ban on Call of Duty because of these suicides. And some people came out and they said, well, maybe these young men, they were more vulnerable than other young men. And that's entirely possible. I mean, they did suffer a tragedy and their family suffered a tragedy. But vulnerable to what is always the question. In order to do that, in order to know that, you need to know what, what is the denominator for kind of a signal to noise detection task. So it, young men in the United Kingdom, just like young women in this country who use social media, they're more likely to use social media or play Call of Duty than to wear socks. It's, it's a common factor. It, it, it's, it's easy to make an attribution to it. And that, that kind of making that observation from that anecdote, it leads you to think about, well, maybe there are just people who are kind of person by situation vulnerable. 
that is entirely possible. That's called a, a diathesis stress hypothesis. Um, it's studied quite a bit in different parts of psychopathology research. But it needs to be principled. You need to actually have a, a, a formal causal model and reasons to believe that these intervening factors, like a certain type of susceptibility to influence, uh, 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 exist and are measurable. But instead, what, what we typically get is kind of a story told backwards from an anecdote, uh, often a tragic anecdote. And so yes, it's entirely possible. Um, but I'll tell you that we've spent the last seven years looking for it, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we haven't found it. And, and kind of ironically, some, not ironically, but very obviously, some of the groups that you might think of as quote unquote more vulnerable from a, a white heterosexual 41 year old uh, are actually po either potentially very boring or very interesting resilience factors, which is to say that some people from different backgrounds, um, they have real problems in their lives, and social media has really no connection to their well-being or mental health because their ups and downs have to do with real life. Uh, to to now be a Descartes myself. Yeah, Descartes dualism, great. Okay, well I think we're at time, so let me just say thank you once. Oh, what? Let's uh, Ben, do we have one? No, we don't have. Yeah, we have time for one small question. Let's just go, since we haven't had just cut in off the, the feet of people who couldn't be here, and we can do this all day. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm one of the reasons why some of those uh, research uh, about uh, suicide uh, are being published. But I want to tell you the backstory. So in 2013, Facebook published this research about uh, emotional manipulation in social media. And uh, they, I don't know if you remember this, uh, uh, this publication. It was also retracted because it was uh, too much unethical. Mm -hmm. Basically, they uh, test uh, on the algorithm of the newsfeed to show negative content or positive content to test how people were reacting. And uh, the beginning of the uh, research that, uh, that later on influenced the digital method to do social science uh, in social media was to try to separate the variable of the algorithm, of the content available, mm -hmm. and of the behavior of the people. Because if you don't separate those variables, uh, you end up uh, to study the mixture of too many things. Mm -hmm. And in contrast of the research you show that uh, are made uh, with a uh, very large aggregated data set, mm -hmm. this kind of study try to um, test one condition and study how the machine reacts. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, if you test uh, with, uh, let's say, profiles that are entirely clean, synthetic profiles, mm -hmm. sock puppet audit is, is the technical name, and you start to follow content that's uh, may lead to depression, may lead to um, hate speech uh, or hateful behavior, and you realize that uh, the platform is actually showing you only that content, mm -hmm. you start to develop this claim. And then you can also uh, start to point more better the fingers on where is the responsibility. Okay. <laughs> yes. yeah. no, no, that's great. So I want to start off. I can't imagine. I can't imagine anyone running a study like that. Unethical, um, wildly unethical. But no. Um, in, in all seriousness, no. I, I I understand what you're saying. That there there could be a plausible nuanced mechanism that that only uh, kind of being able to to conduct formal causal research on a platform would be able to detect, which is to say, in 99 cases out of, ten, uh, out of 100, or some set of cases out of 100, there is, there is something really toxic and, and really bad going on. Um, I, I don't let tech companies off the hook for that, and I think that that work is absolutely important and absolutely should be done transparently, and we've called for that. Um, I don't think it's intrinsically unethical. Um, but. But that said, this, uh, I think your question presumes to, to test a very nuanced mechanism and a very nuanced idea or conceptualization. You know, surely this is the reason why X is correlated with Y. Um, and and it, it might not be the case that X and Y are correlated with each other. There may not be two things related to each other that need a mechanism. That specific mechanism that you're talking about, that might be an interesting line of research in of itself, but it might not be connected if it's if it's accurate, right? And, and it's worthy of it's obviously worry, worthy of investigation. It it there's no reason to think that it's connected to this narrative that we have about social media and mental health and well-being that is again painted with one of these really broad brushes. Um, and and I would just say, and I, I know we're at time that. It is okay if things go wrong when we use the internet. It's okay that we incur risks when we engage with other human beings and with algorithmic systems. 
That's, that's part of what we learn to do, and we, we're very adaptable creatures. And the question for me is less, is there the possibility that there's something bad about technology? And it's much more, well, do we actually have an effective way of, of, of assessing and, 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 and understanding these risks relative to each other? And, and I, I put it to you that I don't think we do. And I think that the conversation, especially in this country, has been hijacked by a handful of polemicists who are playing on either our good research ideas about specific mechanisms or our general biases, and they're sucking all of the air out of the room for really, truly harmful things that, that, that do happen on the internet, um, that, that, that are involved in child exploitation and things like child trafficking, that really do deserve 99.9% .9 of our attention, but don't get it because people whine about smartphones, screen time, and social media abstinence pledges, which are entirely epiphenomenal for the things that we should care about as a society or as parents. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you for that question. And thank you once again, Andy. Please join me in thanking Andy. <laughs>